All right, on we move here. Um, we just wrapped up with Kenneth Burke in the previous video, and uh, now we're going to be moving into um, this week's heading on situ rhetoric as situated and rhetoric as narrative. These are important, a couple of important essays and scholars um, that are mostly Fisher, but I, I think Bitzer as well are kind of like extending the kind of work that Burke is doing in rhetoric in the 20th century. And, um, you know, it's hard to cover all Burke's core ideas, even in a single semester. So um, we just got a little taste of him. But, you know, after Burke, rhetoric really opens up. It becomes a much broader kind of area of human social activity uh, in terms of how scholars are thinking about it. Right. They're they're looking around. They're noticing these changes in the 20th century. They're noticing the like, you know, mass technology. They're noticing culture, you know, the influence of culture. And, and um, they're also noticing that um, a lot of the promises of the previous centuries, the modernist promises about the, you know, utopian emancipatory potential of science and technology. These things are not actually panning out. Right. Like technology is lovely, but it's not going to like lead us into this perfect future where we're all flying around in, you know, jet packs or whatever. Um, and so we'll get more into the kind of postmodern reaction next week um, to the modernist kind of a set of assumptions about, you know, the, um, the, the perfectibility of human society through science and rationality and reason that just sort of didn't play out that way. And we're, we're kind of still reckoning with the, um, the fallout. In any case, I wanted to start with um, the Lloyd Bitzer essay, which is uh, a, an essay that's coming to us from the like, mid to late 1960s, which is actually when Kenneth Burke was still very active writing his uh, Motives books. And um, then we'll jump into the uh, little piece by Walter Fisher on, on narratives and narrativity, and that's coming to us from 1994. So we're leaping ahead a fair bit. Um, and Fisher in particular really extends Burke, uh, his ideas on drama and, and um, the, the, the rhetoric of, of storytelling and narratives and so on. And he does some interesting things there, kind of bringing together like Perelman's stuff on argument analysis and um, Burke's stuff on like aesthetics, right? It's quite interesting. Um, so I'll start off with Bitzer, the rhetorical situation. This is, I think, the very first essay I ever read about rhetoric. I, I was an undergraduate in an, um, it was in my second or last, second or third last semester as an undergraduate. I had to take a rhetoric class. I didn't even know what it was. And this was on the syllabus. Um, and it really kind of rocked me just to think about rhetoric in this quite specific concrete way that I think this piece it's a little longer than the Fisher piece but I think it's even easier to read because it sort of boils rhetoric down to some very specific kind of components and it's useful um, some believe that it's a little too cut and dried and so it's given rise to all kinds of kind of commentary essays but I think it still holds up quite well and, and I still like to teach it and it's really useful for like projects like conducting an analysis you can point to specific kind of moments here so um, I'll do bits of first and then we'll move into the Fisher piece and try to draw some kind of connections and note some themes running through here. Um, keeping in mind, of course, that we're, we're still kind of coming out of that modernist period where there's this sort of dominant knowledge, as, as Fisher will talk about. It's dominant knowledge is believed to be objective and rational and scientifically sort of uh, achieved right through measuring and testing and and if we just use our scientific instruments and our logical reasoning well enough then we will be able to get at the truths that exist within the ordered universe right this is known as positivism that like we line up our scientific tools and instruments and methods in our brains to line up with the kind of the perfect order that exists within the world itself that was the belief right um that all kinds of starts to fall apart in the 20th century. And so um, this notion that like we can come up with like true knowledge, logically, scientifically, empirically, and then that true knowledge will govern all of our kind of decision making about the organization of society. Um, it's really unraveling in the middle part of the 20th century because it's, you know, 
increasingly we start to realize that like the way that actual life plays out oftentimes um, runs in conflict with the sort of like the supposedly, you know, rational way that we're supposed to understand things, right? And it's like human societies don't necessarily run like railroad tracks or like um, some kind of a machine, right? So we're kind of dealing with that. Bitzer is useful, I think, because he really brings down to like the concrete, specific, grounded, everyday reality, um, the rhetoricity of our kind of daily life, right? And so Bitzer is extending Burke to the extent that he is thinking about the kind of the situatedness, obviously that's the title, but the kind of the, the particular and, um, and, and pressing um, occasions or moments in our lives, our social lives or public lives, where rhetoric is kind of called into existence, right? This is the rhetorical situation. Um, I'll just kind of move swiftly here because there's just some key moments and then he sort of explains things, but I just want to get to the key concepts here. Um, he says on the second page, at the end of that first paragraph, he says, it is clear that uh, situations are not always accompanied by discourse, nor should we assume that a rhetorical address gives existence to the situation. On the contrary, it is the situation which calls the discourse into existence. A rhetorical situation is a situation essentially that needs solving or easing or, um, you know, addressing in some kind of a way. It's a problem. It's, it's something that's gone wrong. It's a, as he'll say in a moment about the exigence, it's a defect marked by urgency, right? So whenever you feel yourself compelled to speak about some kind of social problem or situation that's arisen, you find yourself in a rhetorical situation. Maybe you live with roommates and, you know, they leave dishes out and you've tried not to, you try to be cool about it and try not to say anything, but at a certain point you feel really compelled to like speak about this situation. Um, and maybe you bring in one of your, a couple of your other roommates to like help you. Like, can you guys help me like deal with this other roommate who's just like a total slob, right? Um, that would be a decent kind of little miniature model of the rhetorical situation, but we'll, we'll get to the rest of it here. Um, so, but the point for, for Bitzer is that exist, situations exist sort of in the world, outside of us, right? And I think often of like, you know, what was going on in Flint, Michigan with the poison water. I don't know if you heard too much about this, um, but a couple years ago, we learned that, you know, in Flint, Michigan, that the civic water supply was actually toxic, right? And it's like, oh my goodness, we got to do something about this. So all of a sudden people start kind of addressing it and giving talks and speeches and writing things and so on. And so here's a, a situation that concerned citizens were kind of wading into to address through speech, through language, and so on, right? And so to the extent that we can do something about a problem or a tension or a, some kind of issue, to the extent that we can do something about it by talking to one another, to an audience, by finding an audience or, or grabbing an audience and kind of med using them as the mediation between myself as the kind of concern rhetor and the problem, then we are in fact in a, in a rhetorical situation as he's describing here. Um, so his first thing that he's doing in that, that first section, page three, is to sort of differentiate what he means by situation from some other terms. So he's not, um, it's not context, it's not um, setting, it's not occasion. Don't forget, you know, with Aristotle, we got the three genres of rhetoric. He also called those the, the species or the kind of like occasions for rhetoric. You can think about the ju ju judicial occasion. The, these are like sort of recurrent um, recurrent occasions in the sense that they become genres, just like what uh, Burke was talking about with um, recurrent situations that we name, you know, using parables, right? So... That was more Aristotle's approach is like there's these kind of frequently occurring types of moments where we do these kinds of things and we can call these the genres of the species of rhetoric. This is much different. This is more about the kind of the overall daily life of society and how things bubble up and we have to kind of deal with them, right? And so a situation can arise kind of whenever and wherever. But we know we're in a situation when there is a, a pressing problem that's urgent, that's compelling, that, re, that sort of demands or, or asks for our, our discursive attention, right? Um, so he says at the end of page three, a work of rhetoric is pragmatic. It comes into existence for the sake of something beyond itself, to accomplish something. It functions ultimately to produce action or change in the world, you bet. 
It wants to do something. It wants to solve attention. It wants to ease attention. It wants to make things a little better or different or whatever, right? It's always trying to kind of manage, manage and smooth and and change and alter and improve. It performs some task. In short, rhetoric is a mode of altering reality, not by the direct application of energy to objects, but by the creation of discourse, which changes reality through the mediation of thought and action. You bet. Um, <clears throat> gives an example there, fishing, um, and it being in a fishing boat and everything that you're saying is essentially some kind of like pragmatic call, right? Like, Oh, look over there, or don't forget this thing, or whatever. Everything's sort of generated by some immediate need. Uh, top of page five, he says, let us regard rhetorical situation as a naturally occurring context of persons, events, objects, relations, and an exigence, which strongly invites utterance. And then at the bottom of that page, he really kind of lays it out. He says, this is page five. So, hence to say that rhetor rhetoric is situational means, one, rhetorical discourse comes into existence as a response to a situation in the same sense that an answer comes into question, uh, into existence in response to a question or a solution in response to a problem. Two, a speech is given rhetorical significance by the situation, just as a unit of discourse is given significance as an answer or as a solution. Da -da -da. Three, a rhetorical situation must exist as a necessary condition of rhetorical discourse. Yep. Um, many questions go unanswered. So just because a rhetorical situation uh, or a rhetorical situation can persist, right? It, it could be the case that, you know, the old, like, if a tree falls in a forest and no one hears about hears it kind of thing or sees it, um, a, a situation could exist and no one is there to see it or address it or whatever, and it can just persist, right? Um, and then finally maybe is is time. You know, this business about Harvey Weinstein is, is, is weirdly sort of illuminating here because, um, you know, obviously he's in jail and he's going to basically rot in jail. Um, but it's, you know, if you'd been paying even that much attention, you'd heard these kinds of stories about Weinstein for, for many years. I, I was sort of even, I'm not in the industry or anything. I just like film and so on. And, um, that guy was like talked about for quite a while, you know, it was just kind of there. And then all of a sudden it became a kind of rhetorical situation where now, I think it was a New Yorker piece or a New York Times piece about Weinstein and all just kind of like started coming to the fore, right? Um, so you can think about situations as these sort of more amorphous things and, and they can intensify and they can become, you know, more urgent, less urgent and so on. Um, and the rhetoric comes into existence through the speakers, through concerned citizens, through individuals, and hopefully, you know, through marshalling discourse, they're able to do something about that situation. That's the whole point. Um, so now in the second section here on page six, he uh, identifies the three core elements of a rhetorical situation being exigence, audience, and constraints. That's why this piece is really handy, right? It's literally like you can use it. It's handy in terms of analysis. It's handy in terms of like um, even thinking about, you know, whether or not something's a situation and what might be able to be done about it and so on. Um, and these are each important elements that he talks about in some detail. So I'll, I'll just kind of hit them broadly. I think they're not too terribly difficult. But an exigence, as we've already noted, as he says here, it's an imperfection marked by urgency. It's a defect, an obstacle, something waiting to be done, a thing which is other than it should be. Um, so an exigence which cannot be modified is not rhetorical, right? So... Um, I don't know, a forest fire. You can't give a speech about a forest fire, right? Just do your best to, to manage it. I don't know. Maybe it, maybe it's rhetorical if, like, no one's aware of it, and it's like, yo, the forest is on fire. Let's do something. Um, Thus, whatever comes about of necessity and cannot be changed, death, winter, some natural disasters, for instance, are exigent just to be sure, but they're not rhetorical. Yeah. So it's a, it's a rhetorical exigence if rhetorical discourse can um, cycle back and, and affect it in some, some positive way. Um, now, he goes on to some at some length about sort of what is and what isn't an exigence. Um, one of the first pieces that came out after this one to sort of challenge it is this uh, piece by um, uh, Richard Vatz called... Um, rhetorical situation, and what was it called? Um, 
the myth of the rhetorical situation, I think. And he, that's his whole point was we create situations, you know, like the chicken little thing. Like we can create urgency through discourse, regardless of whether or not something's actually happening in the world, right? Uh, Bitzer, you know, obviously would disagree. For Bitzer, there's a, like a real problem out in the world that needs to be solved, right? Um, so he's sort of like, positioning this notion of exigence against different kinds of, of ways of thinking about it. The bottom of 70 says the second constituent is audience, right? So um, audience as mediators of change is the way to think about this, right? So who are those individuals, those groups, those people out there who, if properly appealed to, can enact the kind of change that we would we would hope, what's that phrase, be the change you hope to see kind of idea, right? It's like motivating this idea that like if you're concerned about that thing, then let's try to do something about it. Bitzer's point would be that the rhetoric, the language, the, the arguments, the speech itself should sort of kick that whole process off. So he says at the top of eight there, properly speaking, a rhetorical audience consists only of those persons who are capable of being influenced by discourse and of being mediators of change, right? So those people who are sort of practically speaking, able to access or hear this message or see this message or receive this message, and then ultimately maybe do something about it, right? That's a big question, who that includes and doesn't include. Nevertheless, that's, that's the idea. Uh, and then finally, this business of constraints, and this is a this is a big one, right? It's like it can go in many directions, but basically, it's um, it's connected to what page here? Yeah, page ten, the second kind of overall characteristic of of rhetorical situation. He says, number two, although rhetorical situation invites response, it obviously does not invite just any response. Thus, the second characteristic of rhetorical situation is that it invites a fitting response, a response that fits the situation, right? So I think you can think of the question of fitting and the business of constraints in a similar way. So what is fitting to some problem, he says, will be largely um, coded by the problem itself, right? And so what a fitting response to this situation would be is largely driven by the particularities of that situation. So you got to kind of make sure that you're addressing, you know, what is unique about this particular exigence, right? Um, and not everything's available then, you know? So the constraints are, are largely, I think, connected to this idea of what's appropriate and what's fitting. Um, what does he say here? Standard sources of constraint include beliefs, attitudes, documents, facts, traditions, images, interests. My goodness, there's a lot. And when the end order enters the situation, his discourse not only harnesses constraints, but given by situation, but provides additional important constraints. For example, his personal character, his logical proofs and style, right? So it's everything that kind of like gives particular shape to this specific exigent problem situation, right? The constraints are, you know, could be constraints of time, could be constraints of money, involved. There could be constraints of mediation and technology and how you actually reach people, right? What is it that um, influences and shapes and allows or disallows this discourse to achieve its result? That would be the constraints. So there you go, gang. That's really it. That's the three elements of rhetorical situation. Um, he ends by sort of marking these different um, what does he say? The general characteristics. The first one being rhetorical discourse is called into existence by situation. The situation which the rhetor perceives amounts to an invitation to create and present discourse. So he's really hitting this point. Like it's the situation that calls forth the rhetoric. It's the problem in the world that calls forth the rhetoric. Um, we covered the second one. The third one, if it makes sense to say, this is page 10 at the bottom, to say that situation invites a fitting response, then situation must have somehow prescribe the response which fits. Um, so that's a really interesting way of thinking about it, right? So like, you know, what is it about this particular exigence that, that I need to, you know, be mindful of as I'm crafting my message, my discourse, and so on? Um, and number four there on page 11, he talks about the difference between like a real exigence and a sophistic exigence. Um, I had a, we had a grad student in our department a year or two ago, wrote her thesis final project on um, the anti-vaccination movement, right? And um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the anti-vaxxer kind of argument, but it's basically like we should not vaccinate our children because there's like, 
you know, serious reasons to be concerned with uh, medical professionals and the health industry and so on. And there's a couple of cases where, you know, children received shots and, and bad things happen, right? Um, and so what we talked about with this project was the possibility of like a sophistic exigence, right? So um, it could be the case that, you know, vaccination is not the real exigence. It's just the kind of the nearby proxy exigence for a deeper exigence, which is the, you know, the corruption of our health and medical industry. I, I'm someone who um, spent some time, a fair bit of time this last fall, getting a bunch of tests done for something I discovered and ended up being not too bad, but the process was just like horrible. I'm still kind of trying to finish it up. Um, but it's just an awful system here. And I'm sorry to say, like, it's just not good, man. It's expensive. It's, it's, it's confusing. It's like, you don't, no one ever knows who's doing what. There's no like one source of information. It's just crazy. So you can understand maybe like a real problem, a situation of like, citizens being just kind of like worked over by this health industry, this big, vast, complicated thing. And it's hard to kind of argue with something that's big and complex and diffuse and so on. But here's a specific kind of problem that we can say that, we, even if we might actually agree that it's a good idea to vaccinate, it's a kind of proxy exigence for our other problems that we're having with the, uh, the system. Maybe right, maybe not right, but I thought it was interesting in terms of like Bitzer's whole business about like real situations and not, not quite real or kind of fictive ones. Um, there's a lot more stuff to play with there and, and we don't need to go too deep into Bitzer. I just wanted to uh, hit this essay because it is, I think, a really good one for thinking about, again, the everydayness of rhetoric, the pragmatic you know, nature of rhetoric. Um, this movement away from the, the modernist impulses that want to see knowledge as universally kind of applicable, right? And if any problems exist on the ground, it's only because of like a, um, a, a misuse of the, of the theory or the model or whatever, right? The rhetoricians of the, you know, early to mid part of the 20th century and onward, we're, we're really starting to push back on this idea and to say, no, 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 what matters most in our lives is happening right now on the ground every day. And we need to make decisions on the fly. We can't rely on these big scientific, you know, logical models to, to govern all of our understandings of, of what's right and wrong and so on. We need to think about the pragmatic rhetorical influences that are all around us. And with that, how am I doing on time here? 22? All right, might be able to do this, okay. With that, we will move now into the Walter Fisher essay on um, narrative, the narrative paradigm, which he's uh, fairly famous for now. And, um, you know, this is clearly something that he's picking up from Burke. Um, the idea that we can, we can kind of understand different kinds of, of discourses through narrative. Um, you know, narrative itself, storytelling, essentially, is, um, you know, we go to movies, we love watching shows, we love reading stories and, and fantasizing and imagining and so on, because these are such human enterprises, right? Like, we tell stories. Sitting around a campfire telling stories is one of the most, like, fundamental human things we can do um, in, in terms of this, this thinking here, right? So... Um, we can take the insights of how narratives work and we can apply them to things that we might not imagine to be narratives. In this particular essay, he's interested in scientific discourse. Now imagine this. Now think about how far we've traveled from Descartes. It was Descartes and Ramus who basically said, science over here, science and logic over here, anything like aesthetic or imaginative or creative or subjective, that goes over there. And they were separated for about 300 years or more, right? Now we have um, a, a mid 20th century effort to just like destroy all those old assumptions, right? And again, we saw this first with Perelman, the values business. Remember I talked about the fact value split in that Perelman video. Here's a, a great extension of those insights. Now what, 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 falters, what, what Walter Fisher is doing here is he's, um, he's well, Specifically, what he's doing is he's kind of extending his um, theories of narrativity, right? This is like, here's another attempt for me to try to like, explain and show my theory um, operating in this particular instance in a scientific paper, right? So, whereas with Burke, we got in the, 
literature is equipment for living, we can see how proverbs, we can see how stories and so on and so on are rhetorical. Now extend that insight. Now scientific discourses are narrative. To the extent that they are narrative, they are also rhetorical, right? So he's now making this move um, that we'll see more and more. But basically, it's it's whereas the mod the early moderns were saying, you know, science and reason and truth and logic are all here and it's privileged and that's what we're going to pursue and all that other stuff, the art stuff and the you know the feeling stuff and the body affectation that gets just all kind of shoved off to the side. Now we are in a place of saying ah. It's actually the other way around, right? All you guys obsessed with your facts and your reason and your logic and your rationality and so on, you're clueless. You don't realize just how much values, human values, inform and shape and govern and guide all of that other stuff. All of our scientific inquiry is, is driven by human fears and desires and, and it all kind of comes back to the human. Right, and we are not just these kind of rational reasoning machines, as we wanted to believe for a couple hundred years. We are feeling machines. We are irrational machines. We are machines with values. Right, and so what Fisher's doing here is number one is talking about sort of extending his theories on on the narrative paradigm, and doing so by showing how you can bring in the uh, insights of narrative paradigm to something like a scientific paper. It's pretty wild. So what he's showing is like you can actually see how even in the science community they're doing things that, that are rhetorical, right? So even science is rhetorical. They're trying to win an audience. They're trying to establish their credibility. They're trying to, you know, position themselves against other audiences and other interpretations and so on. Now, all of these enterprises and activities are rhetorical in the sense that they are, you know, imperfect, partial, on the fly, and so on and so on. So um, there's lots of really interesting good stuff in here. I don't want to go, like, we, you know, I could spend quite a bit of time going through all the particulars, but I'll just try to hit some of the, the key stuff. Um, yeah, so he says about six lines down the first page that the present essay is meant to substantiate my claim that the narrative paradigm can account for scientific discourse, that scientific discourse is narrative and therefore rhetorical. Um, he says at the end of that paragraph, I shall maintain that narrative rationality, the logic that extends the narrative paradigm, entails a reconceptualization of knowledge, one that permits the possibility of wisdom. Right. So again, getting back to that modernist kind of dichotomy between facts and values, the kind of knowledge that goes along with just strict facts is certainty, right? And it's just kind of like rationality. What about the logic or the kind of knowledge that comes with, you know, the other side of the ledger, the values ledger, right? He wants to sort of argue for wisdom. What we need is wisdom, not just accurate information and a true objective knowledge, but we need wisdom. We need the ability to make judgments. We need to be able to kind of understand values and how they're present anywhere, right? Not just in literature, as Burke talked about, not just in, you know, public um, controversies and situations like Bitzer's talking about, but even in the places that we might ex least expect to find human values, science, the discourse of science by scientists, right? So it's quite a, quite an endeavor he's taking on here. Um, and he's saying, essentially, what he ends up showing is, you know, you can um, you can analyze a piece of scientific discourse using this narrative rationality or the logic of the narrative paradigm by boiling it down to two particular um, features here. This is kicking in on 22. At the top, he says, um, I agree with Prelly that rhetoric and science are compatible. Rhetoric and science are compatible because scientific discourse practices are governed by a rhetorical logic. Um, this is just a setup still, sorry. Uh, he says, the next paragraph, there's no question that scientific discourse practices are rhetorical. Um, whether involving the specialized audience of scientists or the generalized audience of the public, in both instances, rhetorical motives and rhetorical means are at work. The desire to get, this is all pretty crucial, the desire to gain adherence, adaptation to audience constraint, that's Bitzer pretty much, and the use of strategic persuasive symbols, including charts, graphs, pictures, all that stuff's rhetorical. Justification, 
to convince a specialized audience and translation for a generalized audience are both rhetorical doings, practices. All of this stuff that's normal everyday practice for scientists is rhetoric, he's saying. So it's this really interesting kind of historical moment where after a couple hundred years of science, science, science over here and all that other crap over there, now we're, we're flipping it. It's like a big judo flip, historically speaking, where now if values were below facts before, now facts um, are down here and values are up here in terms of priority, but also the understanding that like values are kind of everywhere percolating underneath and that's what makes them primary, right? Um, doing science is a particular form of problem solving, having two interdependent uh, phases, discovery and verification, right? Next page over. Um, he wants to suggest that like, you know, narrative paradigm helps open up are an understanding of even scientific discourse beyond just the kind of like objectivist uh, criteria for understanding it, right? Um, page 23, narrative rationality, revisited. So yeah, this is pretty clutch. 23 and 24 are, and 25 actually are, are key pages. Um, especially that first footnote, because there he sort of breaks down what he means by narrative rationality. It's a really interesting phrase, because when we think of narratives, we just think of like free-form stories, right? Just like you made it up. It's fiction, right? But rationality gets to like more technical, scientific kinds of like this rational process, which is streamlined and efficient and, you know, very mechanical kind of idea. So this idea of a narrative rationality is like, what is the logic of narratives rhetorically speaking, that, that win, win over audiences. Um, <clears throat> so that, yeah, that whole chunk on 23, that top chunk is clutch, he says, um, toward the bottom. These elements appear not only in legal, philosophical, political, and historical discourse, they're also common in aesthetic, religious, and scientific texts as well. Basically saying, like, after Burke, everything's rhetoric, everything's rhetorical all the way down whether it's a, a, a church sermon or a scientific conference or a paper and, you know, coming out of a specialized technical community or whatever. It's all human. It's all got values underneath it. And our job as students, critics, analysts of rhetoric is to try to get at that stuff. Um, so he says, most importantly, however, they are formed as clear-cut inferential or aesthetic expressions. And whenever they arise, they will be value-laden. That is why narrative rationality includes tests of values and reasons. Humans are valuing and reasoning beings. We're not just reasoning beings, which we are, but that's not our basic, you know, fundamental aspect. We are also valuing, moralizing, feeling creatures, right? And we've got a rhetoric, the rhetorical theorists at this time were starting to really get serious about that idea that had been rejected for so long. All right, so at the bottom there, he says, the two major considerations in narrative rationality are coherence and fidelity. Um, and he breaks those down a little bit further, right? So next page over is where he gets all, all the particulars, and he's going to spend his time on fidelity. But, you know, what's coherent? Is a text coherent, narratively speaking? Well, there's th three ways of knowing it. The first is concern for argumentative or structural coherence, excuse me. Second, concern for material coherence. And third, concern for character illogical coherence, right? And I just noted in the margins here, the first one is the text itself internally. Is the text internally coherent in terms of its own argumentative and structures and organizational, right? It just on its face, is it coherent? Uh, material coherence is the text in relation to other texts like it, right? Does it sort of, does it cohere with what other people are saying? Is it sort of, um, you know, it, is it verifiable in that outward sense? And then, of course, the character of the speaker, the ethos, essentially. So the first two are kind of logos considerations, and the second, uh, the third is, is more uh, ethos consideration. That's co coherence. He's more interested in um, fidelity. So he says, testing for fidelity in the middle of 24 is not merely an assessment of formal or informal soundness and thinking. Since values inform reasons, it is necessary, indispensable, to weigh values in discourse to determine their worthiness as a basis of belief and action. Testing for fidelity uh, for the truth qualities not revealed in considering matters of coherence then entails two lines of assessment. Weighing the elements of a message usually regarded as its reasoning and weighing the values it explicitly or implicitly conveys, right? So fidelity, the first one, is basically that kind of objective outward truth quality, right? Um, is it accurate? Is it, you know, is it precise? Is it um, uh, 
repeatable and so on, right? So those are all the sort of standard objective ways of, of deciding if something is, um, fidelity is like faithful, right? If you're in, if you have an infidelity, it's like you're not faithful to your partner or whatever, right? And so fidelity is, is it faithful to reality? Is it faithful to what's come before and so on? That's all the rational side. That's all kind of fact, objective stuff. But the second one is the key one. That's the one he's most interested in, right? So the second one is weighing the values it explicitly or implicitly conveys. That's really the nub of this whole business of analyzing a discourse narratively is to be looking for those values that are either implicit or explicit. Um, so he says in the next paragraph, in the second instance, one tries to answer the following questions related to values. What are the implicit and explicit values in the story? Are the values appropriate to the nature of the decisions or beliefs that the story concerns? And so on and so on and so on. All right. Next, he's going to give us a little just quick discussion about knowledge and different kinds of knowledge. And then he's going to move into his artifact. And this knowledge business is actually pretty useful. And you can think about it as modernist and like postmodernist or early modern, late modern or whatever. But like the tacit knowledge, uh, sorry, the, the first knowledge, knowledge is objective. We've talked about this before. When I gave that little thing about the, the two kinds of, of communication, I can't remember which video it was. We talked about like, you know, the, the correspondence theory of communication. That's objective knowledge, right? This idea that knowledge is the goal of knowledge is to map the external world or even the internal world, maybe it's our brains, right? But the kind of the objectivist material world to map it, to know it, to study it. And again, for, for truthfulness, right? To find the correspondences. Um, and he says that the tacit knowledge of this mindset is that all problems are fundamentally logical puzzles, right? We just got to figure out which theory to draw on that are to be solved by empirical investigations tied to such systems as cost-benefit analysis and so on. Method, techniques, and technology are its means. Efficiency, productivity, power, and effectiveness are its values. This is good. This is the key part right here. Knowledge from this perspective combines what Gilbert Ryle called knowledge of that and knowledge of how, right? So objective knowledge is a knowledge of that thing. And it's interested in how we understand that thing. That's objective knowledge. Um, and that's modernist. That's the modernist sort of the dominant modernist sort of approach to inquiry is is that that approach. Um, but he says toward the bottom of that paragraph, he says the uh, the dominant notion of knowledge, which is the legacy of positivism, ill serves questions of justice, happiness, and humanity. Aha! So the knowledge of that and the knowledge of how does not get at the question of the knowledge of whether to, right? And that's that's a pretty brilliant insight. It's pretty simple in some respects, but it's also like, wow, yeah, yeah, absolutely, right? So objective knowledge is about knowing what or that and knowing how to know that or what, right? But it doesn't get at that question of whether we should, whether to, right? That's the value question. So he says... Um, uh, yeah, so what is left out is knowledge of whether, whether or not some things are desirable uh, to do what is beyond his budget. The dominant knowledge, notion of knowledge, which is the legacy of positivism, modernist positivism, ill serves questions of justice. Yeah, I already hit that. All right, so next paragraph. Knowledge of whether, as I'm calling it, has its origins in Aristotle's concept of practical wisdom. Aha, we're back to Aristotle, phronesis, practical wisdom, being able to make judgments in a moment, in a situation, as Bitzer would say, right? This is the, this is how we live. This is what's important. And rhetorical scholars are, are getting hip to this, this fact uh, at this point here. All right, so um, he then provides a, an analysis, it's really interesting, of this paper by Watson and Crick, uh, mid-20th century, where um, the, the human DNA strand had been mapped. We've, we've sort of we've figured out the, the secrets, the genetic coding secrets of life itself, right? Um, and so, you know, you hard pressed to find a more like high level scientific paper than that one. And so he's going into that essay, that paper, and basically conducting a narrative analysis of it to see this business of like um, the knowledge of that and the knowledge of how, which they cover thoroughly, but ends up, and this is just a quickie summary of his analysis, is like, they, you know, the paper does a nice job of giving us the objective coherence and fidelity, 
But what it doesn't really give us is that value question, right? Um, the knowledge of weather. And so that's sort of how he uh, ends up. It's interesting because his analysis is not so much a critique of how they failed to be objective. He's basically saying like, yeah, they're doing what they should have done, scientifically speaking. Um, they just didn't get to the, the business of weather, right? So I don't know if you've ever heard about this. i got to wrap up here. Um, it's the is-ought problem. You ever heard of the is-ought, right? So just a description of how things are or what is is one thing, but then a discussion of what ought to be or what ought to happen is a kind of another thing, right? But they're related. We have what is, and then we have what ought, what we would like or what we want or what should be or whatever, our sense of how things ought to go. But we also have that which is, right? The objectivist knowledge of that and how is is, is the knowledge of is, that which is, right? It's just sort of like, all right, so here's the human genome or the DNA strand or whatever. That's what it is. And, and the papers, as, as Fisher's noting, the paper, you know, does that fine, right? But it does not address that sort of value question of ought. What ought we do with this or ought we do anything? Um, so let's see here. Page 28 is the other kind of last key moment. And in the middle of that top paragraph, he says, um, impossible to the values, their discourse were particularly pertinent questions of life. Sorry, question of the appropriateness of the explicit and implicit values of the message, the consequences of endorsing the values, um, and the vitality of the enterprise itself. So these are ways of asking questions about values, you know, in anything, right? Um, because we ought to be able to, essentially, right? So the next paragraph, about four lines in, it says they do not, they do not go beyond what exists. The Watson Crick don't go beyond what exists or what is thought to exist, even when tied to the traditional values of pragmatism, efficiency, workability, and success. They do not fully inform the mind to the knowledge of weather, right? That's the ought question. At the end of that paragraph, these values include, as suggested earlier, justice, happiness, and humanity. The bedrock value of praxial consciousness, I believe, is love. That is an abiding concern for the welfare of being of others. So they're, they're, his point is basically like scientists are humans as well. And scientists don't really get to kind of play this like, I'm just a scientist. All I'm trying to do is get at the objective truth. It's like, no, 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 no. You're also a human. You're a citizen. You have to be sort of aware of the values that kind of go along with this, right? Um, so, you know, because of the discovery of Watson and Crick, we now have, we, you know, uh, biologists and genetic corporations and biogen companies and so on have mapped the genome and have picked it apart and are now, you know, creating new kinds of life, essentially, out of, out of their discoveries, right? So... All the controversy around GMOs is, is sort of getting back to this discovery. And as someone who's really interested in food and ecology and, and sort of, you know, um, how we eat and live and so on, um, it's sort of like, ugh, I mean, is this a good thing that we now are able to kind of like create chickens by like, you know, bringing in some DNA from a flower or a frog or a fish? Or, you know, it's like, What's life, right? So these are human questions. These are value questions. These are questions about whether or ought and so on, um, which isn't to say that we shouldn't be like inquiring and, and investigating and scientifically curious and all the rest of it. But we, the point here is to like not see so far apart the business of the is, the fact, the objective knowledge on the one hand, and the, the ought, the values, the how we want to live, the compassion for one another, and whether or not this thing is actually good, whether, you know, like drones, like just because we can doesn't mean we should. I wrote in the column here, and I will, excuse me, I'll end on this. Um, the, uh, yeah, I think I talked about this in the Burke Definition of Man video that, that shows Silicon Valley. Um, I'll just mention it one more time briefly. So the very end of the whole show, the last season, the final episode, um, this is a, this is a show about a, a small, you know, startup company in Silicon Valley that ends up like, you know, this guy has this brilliant idea concept over the course of several seasons. It's all about getting the funding and beating the competitors and all the craziness that happens along the way. And in the final season, it turns out that this discovery, it was about a compression algorithm. It's like, you know, how you, when you send files, you got to kind of like 
you got to compress them and then decompress them. So this guy came up with this compression algorithm that's just wildly more efficient and you can send things without any kind of delay and it's just like revolutionizes the whole the internet essentially. And in the final season, he they decide that they're going to create their own internet to like get rid of this other one that's all corporate and commercial and surveillance and all the rest of it. And in the final final moments of this whole series, what happens is they they discover that this that their own invention is essentially going to, they sort of get a little peek into the future. They let it run loose for a little bit and they discover that it sort of takes over because it's AI essentially, right? And so they, they basically trip into discovering AI and they, 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 get, a, they get a little taste of what it's going to do. And what it's going to do is, um, you know, crack passwords and, you know, break through encryptions and it's going to like, wreak absolute havoc on the security of the nation, the financial system, and they're just like, oh my goodness, what did we invent, right? They decide, and the whole series ends, spoiler alert, um, with them destroying their own invention, destroying their own company, right? By actually lying to the public about their product. They like fake a miserable launch, knowing full well that their product is the most revolutionary thing that's ever been invented. But if they actually went to market with it and, and like unleashed it on the world, it would just be absolute like death and destruction for mankind. Right. And so they, the value question is what kicks in. It's interesting that, you know, an artistic a narrative, a fictional narrative about Silicon Valley is attentive to the value question. It's attentive to the question of the ought. Should we actually send this invention out into the world? Ought we do that? And the, the conclusion of the, the creators of the show is, no, you shouldn't. Basically, it's a jab at a bunch of other stuff that's out there right now. It's like, just because we can doesn't mean we should. You know, the surveillance, the privacy encroachments, all kinds of stuff is, we can do it. We have the knowledge, but ought we, right? And so underneath narrative paradigm is human values. Um, and the narrative, uh, we get a nice little sampling here of like how it is one can actually use or think about the narrative paradigm, looking at coherence, looking at fidelity, and thinking about all the kind of little rhetorical moves that are made within a given text to, to secure an audience, to create that adherence. He uses the word adherence a number of times, which is actually a very Perelman kind of word. Um, all right, this is a long video. Um, sorry, I was just trying to get at two readings, two crucial readings at the same time. Um, I might need to chop this up or just sort of beg your forgiveness. But um, that is it for this week. Next week is critical cultural invitational rhetoric. And then after that is um, about, about technology. So to get back to the whole Silicon Valley thing. Um, as as I've been saying, I'm here if you want to chat. I know some of these readings are a little weird and tricky and concepts can be new and, and challenging. Please don't just feel like I'm not around to, to talk things through with you. I do have time that I can like set up video chats and we can, um, you know, we can just, or even just a phone chat, we can just talk about ideas and concepts. I'm into it. All right. So good luck out there. Hope you enjoy and talk next week.